um, we're installing a reaction mechanism simulator, which is um, we're going to uh, a simulation software, new simulation software we've developed here that we're going to showcase a bit here. Um, so for Linux, so there are scripts available and uh, some IPython notebooks that we're going to show. Um, I mean, don't worry, we'll show you how to open what those are and how to open them and all that stuff. Um, but if you go to this website and copy everything to your home directory. Um, the script, and then you run the script. Um, for Mac users, we found it was so much it was so much harder to write a script for it, and it's so easy to install it that we thought it'd be easier to just have the Mac users and go to the website and install Julia manually. And then it's just a it's basically it's a disk image. So you just open it up and have it you copy it into your application folder and then it's done. Um, and then you'll just run for Mac users. You'll do that and then you'll run the script, the, uh, the script in your home directory. How do you install R, R, sorry, how do you, how do you install RMS without the link? Where is it? Um, see, where does it, it, has, it? It has the link in the script. It, 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 I mean, without the tiny URL, where would it be located? Just generally for someone to find it. Oh, so it's on it's on GitHub. So yeah. We have a, a repository for it. Um, Can it, you it clone? Will soon, it will soon be a registered Julia package. Mm -hmm. um, probably tonight <laughs> at midnight. Um, but uh, right at the moment, it's, it's, What's the, yeah. Um, I'm a little bit unfamiliar with Julia at this point. Sorry? I'm unfamiliar with Julia. Oh, that's that's totally understandable. Well, I was going to talk about that a little okay. bit in a second. So Julia is this <laughs> uh, new computer language. Um, that's essentially, someone looked at C++, Python, and MATLAB and decided there were some things they liked about all of them and some things they didn't like and tried to smish them together. And what it ends up being is it's a... Uh, a pre-compiling uh, pre -compiling language, which essentially means that when you run it, it compiles each function the moment that it's the first time it executes, it compiles that function, and after, every time after, it just calls the compiled code that it made. And it also has um, a, a very interesting type system. Uh, it's hard to go into too much detail on about it, but essentially what it allows you to do is it allows you to code like you're in Python or code like you're programming in C++. And if you code like your program in C++ where you tell it exactly what all the types are, it's very fast and it approaches the speed. It gets very close to the speed of C about within 10% of the speed of C. And um, when you don't do it, it's a lot slower, but you can type it the same way you would Python. Does that make sense? Or answer your question? Yeah, it looks a lot like MATLAB and Python. I'll write it out. Oh, but we won't have to code too much in this example, although I'll, I'll, I'll display almost every line. Yeah. Uh, so just a quick clarification, when you download the stuff at that link, you'll get a folder. What we mean is take all the contents of that folder and make sure that the contents are in your home directory. So inside your home directory, you should see a script install rms.sh. Make sure it's directly under home, uh, along with everything else, uh, not just the folder. If that makes sense. Uh, you. It probably could work if you ran it in that folder. I'm trying to think of how I wrote the script. Um, but it'll install everything. Then where does it install? Uh, it installs, it, it'll create a Julia folder inside your home folder. Or if, you, if you're on Linux, if you're on Mac, um, this procedure will, it will add it as an application in your application folder. Oh, yeah. for, for Mac, and Mac. then, and then the, the, what it does is it adds an alias that links to that application, to your batch, or your batch profile, so that when you, when you, you can just type Julia and it will open a Julia prompt for you. Yeah. Oh, you're, um, you're, uh, for people who are running a Linux subsystem, uh, don't follow the Linux instructions. We'll have to get a little more technical. Um, we're going to, we're going to demonstrate a uh, reaction mechanism simulator, which is a, a new one, but there's a number of, uh, very, uh, uh better known ones. Um, so we'll, we'll do that in a minute. Um, but so here's a bit on all the available uh, software for doing this. Um, so Chemkin is a commercial software sold by Ansys. It's arguably the most expensive software for this. Um, it has a really nice GUI, which is a real big positive for a lot of people, and is the reason a lot of people use it. 
as any other tool. Um, the GUI looks kind of like this. Um, it's very drag and drop. It's a little, it feels a little bit archaic, but it, it the GUI works perfectly fine. Um, if you want to do anything with scripting, we I believe we have some software for it. Um, I think uh, one of the students a really long time ago wrote a mod, Python module called PyChemkin that interfaces with it. But in general, scripting is very painful dealing with Chemkin. Um, so then there's uh, Cantera, which is an open source software. Um, originally developed at Caltech. Um, Ray Spaff here at MIT is the currently developer for that project. It's open source, it's very trustworthy and extensive. It's very much the open source version of Chemkin. Um, it's written in C++. It's a bit more focused on being able to run lots of simulations than on, it doesn't have a whole lot of mechanism analysis tools. Um, there isn't a GUI for it, um, but it does have a Python and a MATLAB wrapper. Um, they don't provide all Cantera's functionality, but they usually provide most of the, most of the stuff that you really need to use for um, be dealing with the sorts of mechanisms that are not um, so RMS, Reaction Mechanism Simulator, is an open source simulation software um, we developed here at the Green Group. So the primary reason we really developed it um, over um, using Cantera was just that it was so difficult to work with Cantera and modify it for other purposes. Um, and sort of what was starting to happen in our group was um, we added a lot of functionalities to RMG that weren't even in any of the other standard available simulation software, um, such as diffusion limitations. Um, and some kinds of sensitivity analysis that weren't available in Cantera or Chemkin. And uh, so what I, I did recently uh, the last, over the last um, six months or so is put this all, put all of that technology together um, into this, this package um, that we're developing that's sort of aimed for dealing with, particularly with lo the large chemical mechanisms that you get from RMG because there are a number of problems with the mechanism analysis tools that are provided by Chemkin and Cantera that are very, that work very well if you're only dealing with maybe 60 species or so. They're perfectly fantastic because you can keep track of everything and all of that. Um, but so with this, because we're dealing with large mechanisms, we're focusing on zero D small reactors. And we provide an improved mechanism analysis tool kit that utilizes um, RMG's flux diagrams, which are highly superior, I, I feel perfectly comfortable saying that they're highly superior to most of the flux diagrams. The flux diagram is available in Kentkin and Kentair. So earlier when you guys all ran the first big tiny little hydrogen mechanism, so this is, uh, this example is going to simulate that mechanism. Um, so can you enlarge it? Can you enlarge it a bit? Enlarge the font? Now we're going to read. So we have our own uh, input file format that's in a YAML format that's a little bit more flexible um, than some of the other stuff you'll see. So you've already seen the Chemkin files that we showed. And the Chemkin files have one really nice property. And the really nice thing about the Chemkin files is that it's easy to write a new reaction. It's easy to sit down and just write new reactions, um, which was why they created it originally, because Chemkin was kind of the original version of this software. Originally, it was an open source um, software. Uh, and what the idea was is that because how they would make mechanisms then was somebody would sit down and write down every reaction they thought could possibly happen and they'd just type them all out. But it isn't such a great format now that we're automatically generating them, primarily because it restricts what kind of input you can put in. So the YAML that I'm, we're using um, allows, allows us to add uncertainty and all sorts of other parameters that get attached to all of the other objects within it. Um, and while we don't have any features yet um, that uh, deal with uncertainty, we're planning very soon in the future to have um, features that will let you do kind of uncertainty analysis from uh, Monte Carlo on these mechanisms and see what happens when you vary the parameters within their uncertainty. So here we've imported, um, and this gives us a dictionary um, the, of phases. And 
So we want, uh, I've named the phase that we're interested in as the gas phase, um, as gas. And so we take the species and reactions out of it. And we use that um, to make an ideal gas object. Um, so this phase object defines all how all the thermodynamic um, and kinetic properties are calculated, how we calculate um, the, the enthalpy and uh, the Gibbs free energy of all of those species, um, and potentially some effects on the reactions, uh, diffusion limitations are done here. And then we define our initial conditions, which is um, essentially just a dictionary mapping um, names of species and uh, thermodynamic variables, temperature and pressure. So what we're saying in SI units, what we're saying here is, is that we're running at 1,000 Kelvin, 10 bar, or uh, uh, 10,000 10, pascals, um, and we're dealing with um, mole fractions of 0.67, hydrogen at 0.3302. And then we construct a domain, and the dome with the what the domain uh, defines is essentially uh, how how the system uh, reacts to changes within it thermodynamically. So in this case, we're defining a constant PP domain, which says the temperature and pressure aren't going to change over the standard reactor, simple very standard simple reactor. Um, temperature and pressure aren't going to change over the. We give it the phase, we give it the initial conditions, and in this case, we're going to say we want sensitivity analysis. And we construct a reactor with a time interval that we want to simulate for. And then um, one nice feature that we have that none of the other softwares has is we let you choose your solver. Um, we, Julia has this really, really nice, extensive suite of differential equation solvers. And um, what I, what's done here is essentially I've exposed most of the interface, which lets you choose any differential equation solver there. Although in general, um, SIBO, BBF um, and some of the other more intense solvers are pretty much are the best for doing these sorts of problems. Have to compile a bit the first time though. And then we create a little object here called the simulation object that lets us run lots of analysis on this stuff. And then we can we can make plots. Um, so this is a, a function we've created that makes it a little bit easier. Um, we, we're telling it essentially that we, we want the end time to be 150 seconds. We want it to start at one thing at 15 seconds. And that we want it to take 1,000 points. And we want to remove all species who have uh, mole fraction less than 0.01. And as you would expect, this gives us hydrogen oxygen and water. We can also look at uh, rate sensitivities here. Uh, to look at what react, what, um, in this case we're looking at sensitivities to the hydrogen, co hydrogen uh, concentration. And so what this tells us is that this reaction is and this, this reaction are the those that most strongly influence the hydrogen concentration. Um, we also have thermodynamic sensitivities. Um, so sensitivities to the Gibbs energy. So these are in units of mole per kcal. Um, and as you can, as well, you might expect, OH is quite a sensitive. Um, the thermodynamics of OH are quite sensitive here. And So here's a time of ROPs plot uh, that we have available. It's, this one's a little bit more obscure, and it's not quite as useful as the, uh, some of the other ROPs I'll show you in a second. Um, but what's nice about this is this tells you what are the most important reactions as the system um, progresses. And uh, this particular one's not particularly interesting, other than it, that it tells you that the dominant um, source of uh, or sorry, what did I come from? The dominant source of the OH radical is um, uh, the hydroperoxide breaking apart into 2OH, and the primary loss function is it reacting with H2, which is what you'd, you'd expect for this sort of system, of course. So now we'll look at a, a liquid system here.
is a diagram that shows all of the that shows um, the fluxes um, moving through all of this, uh, where we have we start with octane and this. Uh, So there's a ra uh, there's a radical on there, and, and uh, there's a radical on here. And what you can see is, is that O2 is taking a radical off all of these, and then O2 gets added. In these these situations for these flexes that adds, adds a hydrogen, and then there are all these other pathways. But basically, um, what it lets you see is it lets you follow what's actually going on in the mechanism, and well, Kemkin and Cantera both have ways to visualize this. None of them have the molecular structures, which is a really nasty problem when you have a 400 species RMG model. And what really, what, what these will all show up if you go and you simulate using Cantera or Kemkin is this will be called um, S of 4110 or whatever, some, some name, S of something, because there are certain restrictions naming, even, there are even some certain naming restrictions um, in those softwares. And so it's hard to even make out what what are, what are different species. And so what this lets you do is this lets you actually kind of look at where the paths are. And you can also note that I told it specifically to make this at this time. You can make it at any time you want, and you can kind of look at how the mechanism is changing, how the flexes are changing over the course. There is one little problem with this. Has anyone spotted the issue, the issue that we're <laughs> that I'm planning to fix soon with this? So it's all it's all great that we know what the molecular structures are, but when you actually want to look at like what the speed, how to um, what the concentration or plot the mole fractions of these species, you have to know what their name are. That what talk about their name is. And so what we're planning to do, and what we haven't done yet, um, because mostly we were just putting the software all together, is we're going to add the name to these images. And once we have the name added, it'll be super easy to do all of that stuff because you'll be able to look at that, take the name. And then you can just type it in and, and look up whatever property you want. For now, you kind of you have to be a little bit um, versed in the naming conventions and work, be able to work out what it is right now. But it's a whole lot better, a whole lot better than um, campaign or Cantera right now. The RMG back in HTML files print out like phosphory. Oh yeah, you could you could use the you HTML files, like you like like you but then you have, but you still yeah. you still have to go back and forth. The idea is that you'll be able to run this and not have to go back and forth between all of this because it's so mess and it's, 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 it's a huge time sink going through these mechanisms. And it, once we can get that working and that set up, this, this should be able to make it much easier to analyze these mechanisms and look at what's actually going on. Not, not to hit too hard on Kemkin's flux diagram tool, which is quite good as long as the names are all consistent, as long as you know what the name of every species is, which in, it, maybe if you only have 60 species, that makes a whole lot of sense. Um, it's, and Kempkins is more interactive than this. It has some nice, uh, just because it's part of the GUI. Um, but for RMG mechanisms, it isn't, it's nowhere near as helpful, and it's a lot more of a mess because you have to keep going back and referencing between all of this stuff. This is uh, the super minimal again, but this time we're going to do a little bit different simulation. We're going to do an ignition delay problem. So in this case, um, we did mostly the same stuff here, except we defined a constant V domain, which essentially assumes that the volume of the reactor is going to be constant, and the temp and um, there's no outside heat transfer that is adiabatic. And so in this case, we're just assuming a constant volume adiabatic reactor, um, both hydrogen and oxygen, which naturally results in an explosion here. Um, and so this is, uh, for practical purposes, um, this is a typical way of simulating a RCM or a shock tube, although there's a little bit, I think there's a little bit of debate on the shock tube. Um, I think some people think it might be better to simulate the constant pressure. Um, uh, but this is how you get ignition delay times. And as you can see quite clearly, there's an ignition event here. Um, so this is the temperature plot, and then we can get the ignition delay time here. And we can also get flux diagrams here.
So in this case, what we uh, and well, not really. I, I think I think I think Max has done the most for this was getting our drawing algorithm to not just um, to also decide what species are so small that you should just give it the. Oh, you didn't do that. Okay. Um, but so here's the diagram for um, hydrogen combustion. It's not as um, not quite as useful as the one when you have tons of species. Because you can you can see that in this case it wouldn't make much difference whether we had the molecular structures or not. Um, so what we also have here, um, another plot, probably more important than the other RFP plot, I should have started with this one, is this lets you plot um, the production and loss for a given species at a given uh, given species at a given time. So here what we can tell, and much like that other diagram, our primary um, source of oil chemicals is um, hydrogen peroxide breaking apart, and our primary loss is the OH radical reacting with hydrogen. But we can do this for all sorts of species. Um, And this lets you look at branching pathways, and this is quite. Um, when you combine it with combine it with this, you can sort of look at um, what are the most important flexes for for a given species. And these this tool and this tool um, sort of provide the back what, um, the backbone for how to analyze these mechanisms efficiently. Is there a reference guide for a user who wants to repeat the process? I mean, all these function names. So, documented. Um, as a part of the, so all of these examples are at least available on the GitHub mm -hmm. site page. Um, I'm, we're still the documentation. Uh, I have the HTML files for it. I haven't been able to get GitHub to launch them yet, uh, but hopefully I'll be able to figure that out next week. Um, so these examples are all on, right. on there. So someone could potentially just download or um, download them off the off GitHub. Um, there's all in the documentation. It goes through all of these functions, all these all the plotting functionality, and all of this stuff, um, and how to be able to manage all of this. Any questions? Yeah. For the flux diagram, are the our wheat and correspond to logarithmically the change in rate, or how is the width being determined? Uh, yeah, it's it, logarithmically. It's related to the change in rate. Um, I've been thinking about changing it though because it, the logarithmic scaling doesn't help that much when you're trying to compare branching ratios, mm -hmm. um, which yeah. is where the ROPs really help a lot. Right. Um, uh, yeah, and also the outlines of these describe the logarithmically scale concentration mm -hmm. as well. So I don't know if people just follow the finish, but I'm gonna go ahead and do the right one, right one out um, and do so we're gonna do the propane branching. Another nice feature that Julia has is um, kind of uh, um, similar to the piece of Python. So in this case, 
I've just pulled up the the file path for uh, uh, for the Kempkin file that we just generated in protein branching. <coughs> and well, we all RMS also before um, the examples I showed, we're all using RMS files. But it can also read um, Kempkin files by themselves, and also Kempkin files with RNGP prediction as well. Um, you just give it the file path. Um, I think it's pretty good. Yep. And here it's named today. So. Here we have an example of propane. Um, so this has this uses all the RMG name um, here. Uh, get water, of course. Here we get a bit more interesting complex diagram. More complicated, certainly. But anyway, I'll go over some quick stuff on simulating magnets. So for choosing tolerances, it's really important. Uh, sometimes you just, uh, especially with RMG models, if you're early on, you don't have good thermochemistry and stuff, it can be quite hard to simulate. In fact, one of the examples I was going to have everybody do if we got this installed properly was the SR test example, which simulates horribly. And the reason is, is that I only added the primary thermal library. And so when you don't give RMG proper thermo and kinetics, it can get the mechanisms can get pretty nuts. In fact, so nuts, in fact, that the simulators can't handle them. 
and you'll get that error in any software. You'll get, in fact, you're more likely to get it in ChemPen than you are in Cantera or uh, the reactive reaction mechanism simulator. Um, so, in terms of choosing tolerances, sometimes you have to deal with those models, though. ATOL is really important because RMG mechanisms tend to deal with radicals. And so, radical concentrations can be quite small. And so, you should never, you should never set it higher than 1E negative 16. Um, and 1E uh, negative 20 is, um, is, is, a very, is sort of the other end where this, this is a very safe value that you should be, you should be perfectly fine using. You're usually fine at 1E negative 16. Um, RTOL, however, when you really need to reduce tolerance, you should be reducing, you should be, um, or increasing RTOL. Um, it's much more flexible. You should try to give yourself a few more digits of accuracy than you need. But this also, being able to do this also, um, a, a lot of times um, can get rid of errors that you're dealing with with the solver. Um, you should recognize that those errors are usually due to the fact there's something wrong with your mechanism, but sometimes you need to look and figure out what's going wrong, and in that case, you need to simulate it anyway. Um, and this is, I mean, for standard, you should probably have this at 1E negative 8, but if you have to, you can, you can raise it a bit um, just to get stuff to work, to get you something to figure out what's wrong with your mechanism. Um, I think I already talked a little bit about this. Um, but sort of what should you look at in the mechanism analysis? Um, so one of the first and main things is sensitivities. Um, and they're the simplest to look at because you can, you can just calculate them. And you can look at what thermal and rate coefficients are the most important, affect the solution the most when you vary them. Um, so those are all things that, in general, when you're in, that tells you that you need to have really good parameters for that. So you should either get really good values from literature, or you should calculate really good values from them. So another major check that's a little bit more related to you have to you have to have a little bit of chemical knowledge, but is to sort of look at do the present pathways make sense within the model? Um, do the ones that it's doing make sense? And do the, are there ones that you expect it to be there that aren't there? And when you're analyzing it this way, what you're able to do is you're able to look and sort of look at those branching reactions. So you plot ROPs at the point where you thought should be happening. And then what you should be able to do is looking there is look at what parameters matter, go to that parameter, look it up in the, your Kempton file. And when you're looking up in your Kempton file, you should be able to say, oh, well, actually, that's a really horrible estimate. And I should get a better number for that because maybe this pathway, RMG doesn't recognize it because that we have that sort of right wrong. Um, because the sensitivities are never, are, there's a story when you have the mechanism mostly right. Um, but when you have the mechanism wrong, the sensitivities aren't um, perfectly helpful because if you're in the wrong location, if you have all the wrong rates, then you're, you'll be sensitive to certain things, but those may not be the real chemistry that you're sensitive to um, when you improve things. So local sensitivity. Um, and so another, and another way kind of related to this one is just, just sort of to look at your mechanism and think about what, if, based on what you've defined, what thermochemistry you've laid out well, what thermochemistry you don't know that well, what, what ways could, changes could drastically change the course of your mechanism. And in one case, one I was working on, I had put in all of these age abstraction rates, and so I was looking at the radicals that, was, that could be made from the, uh, the species I was working with. And, it, and if you, you can sort of, one way to sort of look at this is if you have the thermo of one of those radicals horribly off, you're going to get the concentrations of everything else horribly off. So some of these pathways could be quite important if you've got the thermo right. But if you, as long as you have the thermo wrong, it looks like it isn't important to RNG. 